Okay, so shall we just say it? Yeah, Okay, cool. So uh, well, I'm Tanya, and so I'll give you a little bit of background on myself, and then we're going to jump right into what I've prepared for you. But um, like everybody else has so generously said, I'm here for you. So if at any point during what I have to say today, you something sparks a question with you, please feel free to interrupt me as we go. I want to reroute and to give you the information you need because uh, in my experience in giving these presentations, that creates the most value for you. I think I know what you might want to hear, but you may likely tell me something else, and that's totally fine. So let me um, help you however that's going to take shape. And um, a little bit about myself, so I'm originally from Los Angeles. I was a film major, worked in the television business for many years in the hard hitting world of entertainment news. <laughs> so I worked for the TV show Extra and an E cable networks. The joke is if it starts with an E and ends with an exclamation point, I will work there. <laughs> um, Style Network, I helped to launch that back in its infancy. So. Uh, definitely a, a fun business to be in. I, had, I still have two daughters who are now teenagers, but at the time I decided I really wanted to raise them in Los Angeles and had friends who were, moved out to Kerrville and swore I should come check out Austin, and I did, and I fell in love because it was April. <laughs> and it was 2004, so there was no traffic, but uh, I decided I was going to make this happen somehow, and after taking, I was telling Kim, I took a few years off to be home with my girls, was very ready to get back to work and um, just sort of landed into a job in the publishing business, which is backwards. Most people go publishing to television. <laughs> I'm a television to publishing. But it was fantastic. It was four people when I started there, so very much a startup. The company is called Wendy Book Group. I've been there for 14 years now, and, and today I run it. I'm the CEO of that company. So um, yeah, it's fantastic. We've got 35 people in South Austin. It's a $12 million company, and we've got 40 some odd New York Times bestsellers. So it's come a long way from when I started there, and I've certainly learned a lot in my journey, both from television and in publishing. And the, the meat of what I do now, day to day, I'm very much a hands-off leader with my team. They all know the destination, and I let them chart the path. But when it comes to working with our authors to help them understand a book and its role in a bigger venture, which is what I would typically recommend you adopt as your view on a book, um, that's where I really get involved to help them kind of see the book as a foundational brand building tool. And I've heard a few of you talk about your work in marketing or branding, so I think you'll appreciate what I have to say there. Um, all right, so I'm going to start with, with a question. I would ask you to be honest. How many of you, when you're sitting on an airplane, will pop your earbuds into your ear in the universal sign for leave me alone? <laughs> all right, I appreciate your honesty. Sometimes we don't even turn the music on. It's just there. <laughs> so that was a trick that a friend told me. We were comparing notes about strange airplane experiences. And she said, just put your earbuds in, and nobody will bother you. I was like, I hadn't even thought about that. And so I did it, and it's like magic. <laughs> like, you watch the whole airport like that. Nobody will talk to That's you. That's a New York City subway secret. Is that right? Well, I'm not a New Yorker. We always do that. <laughs> <laughs> earbuds in, head down. Earbuds in, head down. Or close your eyes. Continue sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> I did that too. <laughs> Don't do that while walking. <laughs> so I did that for years. And then as my um, dear sweet daughters became older, frequently my headphones would go missing. So often I would find myself on the plane with no headphones and thought, oh, okay, fine, I have to be social. And now I love, I never have them on the plane with me now because I've come to understand that meeting the stranger who out of max is going to be in your life for two, three, maybe four hours, that's tolerable when you're traveling not too far in any one direction. Um, I meet the most interesting people and the fact that I do what I do for a living it's this wonderful icebreaker that brings out the most interesting responses. So, of course, usually they'll say, are you traveling for business, for pleasure? Are you going home? Are you just leaving? And we'll start this conversation, as usually I'm leaving, and usually I'm going somewhere to, to speak about publishing or brand building or whatever it may be. And they get really interested, and they say, so what do you do? I run a publishing company. And then usually their face goes like, what? <laughs> Those still exist? You know, people are completely shocked. So then we have a little discussion about publishing and compare notes on ebooks and print books. But then the conversation goes one of three ways. Either they say, well, let me tell you about the book I'm reading right now, which is always fun. I love hearing that. It's very interesting to know what people are reading. Or they'll say, this is usually kind of a sheepish response. Well, I wrote a book 
because it, they don't think. Nobody ever thinks their book sold well. It doesn't matter. I, I have an example for you. It's a New York Times bestseller. She didn't think it sold well. So that's, that's another one. But the most common one is somebody who has to kind of warm up to it, but finally says, so I have this book, book idea. I'm thinking about writing a book. And boom, the whole plane ride we spent talking about this book idea and how this can fit into what I would encourage you to see as an ecosystem of ideas that the book is one container for, and we'll figure out how to take that, put it into other formats, so that you're getting the most bang out of the intense effort that it is to write a book. And speaking of which, my book, um, Ideas, Influence, and Income, is I think in these boxes here. And if we don't have enough copies, whoever doesn't get one, just give me a card and I'll get one to the view. But um, everything that I'm going to talk about today, there's like a thousand percent more detail on it in the book, so I won't leave you hanging. It's there as a resource for you, and it's um, my hope that you'll enjoy that. So for many years, my employees, my authors, who are, I also call them my clients, uh, encouraged me and said, why don't you write a book because you have all this great experience, and I have, as many of you will find that you have, even if you don't know it, I have this framework that I would take them through as we sat down and talked. It turned into the title of my book, but uh, <laughs> I also have a little bit too much knowledge about what it takes to write a book because I've seen so many thousands of authors do it, and it's a lot of work. And so for years, I would <laughs> I'm a single mom, I've got two teenagers, there's no way I'm throwing adding a book onto that mix of the way I'm running a company. So and finally, I said, you know what, I need to walk my talk. I'm telling them that this is. A book is your tool to plant your flag as a thought leader, and I haven't done that, and I'm putting myself out there as a thought leader, so I finally buckled down and wrote it, and uh, in the process of doing so, really came to understand my own system for working with people, and it's one of the benefits that we'll talk about with writing a book, is you, because you're being forced to work through positioning and the flow of a framework for a book, you will get so clear on your message and who you serve and how you're differentiated from your competition, even the exercise of outlining your book is worthwhile if you don't take it any further. I'm sure you understand from having written. There's just, it's hard work, but the payoff is huge in the end. So the book is divided into three pillars, so to speak, ideas, influence, and income. And I have authors with tendencies to favor usually one of the three. So my ideas people, those are my writers, they can churn out content all day, but the idea of doing something like this or figuring out how to ask for money <laughs> for their product is it just uh -oh, they, they freak out that it's, it's either against uh, their moral fiber but they just really personality wise aren't equipped for that but that leaves them in a lurch because then they're churning out all this content that has nowhere to go and then at some point you know, if it's satisfying to you to do that that's great but usually they're unhappy in the end the influence people are my social butterflies, and they're the ones who want to get out there and talk, 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 talk about their ideas in the book, but they don't have a product, and they probably don't have the discipline to actually sit down and print out their 60,000 words to finish the book, which people do want. That's another question I get quite often. Uh, but being the influence person is not a bad strength to have. I like to say that I can take uh, someone who can speak on stage and easily coach a book out of them, much harder for me to coach the writer who hates speaking <laughs> into figuring out how to be more extroverted and really kind of hustle to get the book sales that they ultimately want. And then finally, my income people are um, they're product launchers. They'll launch for the thrill of launching, and they've got apps, and they've got workbooks, and they've got every iteration on the book itself. They've got videos. They've got everything under the sun. There's no strategy behind it. There's no cohesive messaging. It's just launch, 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 and there's nothing to tie it all together. And there's different audiences for every product. And at the end, we're left pouring everything onto the table, going, "How do we make some sense of this?" So, I would encourage you, and hopefully you'll get this from the book, that if you can balance each of those areas as you're thinking about any media venture, um, all three of those things are critical because they all work together and they rely on, on each other. So you have to make sure that you're nurturing but also strategically planning for each of those three areas. And we'll touch on all of them, and as a reminder, please feel free to interrupt me and ask questions or guide me as far as how I can help you as we go. Okay, so for ideas themselves, the, the process of writing a book, there's a million books about writing books. My book is only sort of about writing a book, but um, I skipped that for the most part in my own manuscript because there's a million books about it. What I see in my authors most often is a lot of energy and anticipation around starting. It's really exciting to sort of feel this little idea and um, 
see that blinking cursor and just kind of understand the possibilities ahead of you. And then you might have the energy to get through 10, 15,000 words, which is commendable. That's still a lot of writing. And then it gets stuck because it's like all the good stuff came out. And you know this journey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I went through it myself. I got through it. It's like, the worst, oh, right? It's disheartening <laughs> because then you're like, I'm a failure. Well, I got through about 25,000 words, and then I think, I'm done. <laughs> like, surely I have more to say. And thank God that's what an editor does. They'll help you coach that. Because what happens is you're too close to your own work, and you make some assumptions about what your reader already knows. And that is what I certainly did throughout my first draft of my manuscript. And when I had someone read it as a proxy for the end user, the reader, they said, well, I don't know what you're talking about when you talk about selling into retail outlets. I don't even know how you define a brick and mortar account. So a good editor will help you see the stuff that you're missing, but mostly as you're working through any idea and uh, wondering how to get started, especially, if, or how to chip away at it with a little bit of time that you may have in between all of your other obligations, my biggest piece of advice there is to really develop a very detailed outline. I fought my editors hard on this because I thought, I've been doing this for 14 years, and I've got the television stuff behind that. Like, I can see it in my head where the book is going. I don't need to sit down and waste time on an outline. Well, the problem was that I've been doing this for 14 years, and I have all the stuff behind that, because then when I sat down, there was so much to sort through that I could potentially write about that I got blocked, and I didn't know which way to go. There was too much to say, and so I actually had to reel it back and spend be crow and sit down with the editor and say, okay, I really underestimated this, I need your help. Help me understand on a micro level what I should talk about here for it to create value for my reader. And that's what we did. So it literally in the end was an eight page outline, which seems like a lot for a, a 60,000 word book, but it's eight pages of bullet points of what I'm going to cover in each chapter. And then below that, within each section of the chapter, how that information flows so that it all makes sense for the reader and I'm taking them through that information in a way that builds and doesn't overwhelm them at some point. That's the heavy lifting, I swear to you. Once you get through the outline, then it was my pattern to sit in and um, I would jump all around my manuscript. So some days I felt like writing about something influence related and other days I'm gonna write about product. I don't recommend that because it took me a solid two years to write my book. <laughs> And by the end of the two years, I couldn't remember what I'd already written. And so I would start writing about something only to find out when I went through the whole manuscript that I had almost written the exact same thing in chapter one with almost the same words. So it was very consistent. <laughs> <laughs> but it was double work. So if you can, write it with some sequentiality. <laughs> and, and you'll have a much better flow for the reader as well. Um, some of you may be wondering if you should write a book at all and if it is actually a tool that would help you with your business. I'm obviously biased, but I would say in 90% of the cases, the people that I work with who, who come to me with that question and say, I don't know if I should write a book, maybe I should blog, maybe I should do a documentary, was the conversation I had with someone yesterday. Um, and these are all very good questions because content can and should take any number of formats. But the things that are the big payoffs when you're writing a book, especially if it's your first book and it's connected to your business, what I mentioned earlier about getting this extreme clarity on your messaging, you serve the demographics around your reader are probably the demographics of your customer or your business. And you think you know them, but if I sat down and drilled you on it, I bet you there's some gaps in that understanding. So people will say to me, for instance, oh, my book is for all women. No, it's not. <laughs> we are looking for this level of granular. I want to know your book is for women who live in Austin, Texas, who have two kids who live in the suburbs and maybe drive to work for but that's how specific we want to be about who your reader is so that we have a person in our head, like this little avatar that we are writing to as we go. And that is going to give your voice an authenticity and a consistency that will show up throughout the manuscript. So that's something that's sort of a hidden benefit that a lot of my authors don't anticipate in the beginning, but as they work through, if they do it right, as they work through the book writing process, they always say at the end, wow, I didn't realize that I had this framework for my business because it's just what I do every day when I push people. I did the same thing. I didn't realize ideas, influence, and income is this perfect little trifecta. I just sort of talk about it all the time. And it's but it these things develop in you as you do your work. And again, you're so close to it that sometimes it's hard for you to see some of those patterns. So writing is it's just a great way to get clarity and to have that vision that you can carry over into your business. 
Uh, the obvious thing that is a benefit for people writing a book is the book helps you plant a flag as a thought leader. And uh, gosh, if I had a nickel for everybody who said, yeah, if somebody picked up my book in the airport and read it on the airplane and we got off the airplane, he hired me to come in and turn his business around or, um, or do a motivational speech or whatever it is, he usually pays for all the expense of the book. So writing a book, while difficult, I think most people recognize as a huge accomplishment. And when you say you're the author of something, even if you can self-publish today with a couple of clicks, People still will have this reaction, right? Oh, you wrote a book. They're very impressed. It has like a certain reverence to it. And it carries a lot of weight in terms of you as an expert and somebody who's bona fide and not an imposter in your field. And frankly, it's only going to be a good book if you actually are an expert in somebody who knows what they're talking about in their field. It will show itself if you're not quite there. So that's another thing that a lot of authors, uh, another reason why they do the book in the first place is to really establish who they are to plant their flag as a leader in their field and also to differentiate themselves from their competition. It's a way to pre-screen clients in many cases. So if somebody, if you're an investment professional and somebody reads your book on your philosophies on investing, by the time they come to you to come on board for your services, they know exactly how you operate. You don't have to sit there and pitch them and they've pre-screened and pre-selected and you've got a vetted client base. So that's another benefit, another reason people uh, would take, take on the immense work of writing a book. And then <clears throat> finally, if anybody studied word of mouth marketing, rule number one of word of mouth marketing, which is our favorite kind of marketing, is give them something to talk about. So a book is a, it's a tool, it's a promotional tool, it's a thing you can give to somebody, you can leave it on their desk. For some reason, people are really hesitant to throw away books. <laughs> They'll throw away their copy mugs and the pens. But have you ever moved and you're getting rid of your stuff and there's this stack of books, you know, <laughs> I don't know what to do with those, it feels dirty, they're put them in a trash can, if you don't make one like yes. But books have this sanctity, so people tend to hold on to them, and they also like to keep them on a shelf as whether or not they put them as sort of a showcase of what they stand for. If you walk into any reader's office, you'll see book after book after book on, you know, probably lots of Stephen Covey and Malcolm Gladwell, and it, it's all meant to say, this is what I stand for as a leader, you know? It's, I hope people are buying books for other reasons than that, but that's, this, that's the power that they carry in terms of uh, just being a physical or even a digital thing. So books definitely give you something to talk about in that sense and also in terms of having a product launch. So I'm doing it with my book now. It's, it's an opportunity to say, hey, Didia, I've got this new thing coming out. We like it when new things come out and I'd love to tell you about my ideas. And it's, so it's a pitch around a thing instead of just you as a person who's got some experience. There's actually a product launch to tie to a campaign, and that's going to give you a more effective push for whatever it is that you're trying to promote in your business. So the book is, again, part of a bigger vision in terms of building and promoting and nurturing um, a, a brand overall. So that's the, the idea side. Uh, the influence side, <coughs> I have a couple of examples for you to really get a kick out of, I think. So again, this is where my social butterflies really shine. The influence part, it's come to mean social media, and I think the word influence quite frequently, but it's more than that. Um, we talk in publishing with the word platform, that's sort of our go-to term for who is your audience of people who are interested in what you have to say. It's not just the list you've accumulated or bought. They actually want to know what you have to say. It is tremendously difficult to build that list, and it should start really early, probably while you're still writing a book, and there are smart ways to do that. I have some authors who, during the process of writing their book, will basically build a little community to say, here's chapter one. Caveat, your publisher might not let you do this, depends on how you publish, but if you can, it's wonderful practice to say, here's chapter one, or use it as a blog post and say, I love your thoughts. And now you've got this little research and development pool that can give you feedback or point out things that you forgot or overlooked or, again, the assumptions that you make because you're too close to your work. So that's a great way for you to get their feedback and get them to feel like they're engaged and participants in writing your book. Because guess what, at the end, not only are they gonna buy it, they're probably gonna share that news with their friends. So you're amplifying the power of the message. Lots of little tweaks like that that we brainstorm on, on the publishing side as someone's going through this process of launching. But when it comes to influence, um, of course, it's just as important to always be thinking of creating value, not just adding names to the list, as you all well know. 
and uh, of course nurturing and keeping those people in your community after the book launch so that you can continue to engage them later with other products or um, elements of your business where you hope to bring them into your community. So the influence piece will, will involve probably you writing more content <laughs> and often it's something to highlight a concept in your book. Authors hate this. <laughs> They're done writing the book and it's such a task. If they, they're just like, I don't want to see this thing again. You guys take it, do whatever you need to do. And then we turn around and say, great, would you please buy an article <laughs> for the Huffington Post? Thank you. You're going to have to do a little bit more writing to support your writing. It's very meta. But on top of that, you'll probably have a PR campaign and uh, social media efforts, certainly, or digital side of things, the website, all of that is critical. And then I have um, some authors who have really taken into a complete multimedia experience. And then I'll tell you also about what you shouldn't do, but let me give you an example to begin. Mary Lou Quinlan is kind of an unusual author for me. Um, most of the books that I publish, let's see, we have about a thousand on our list now, um, 130 new ones a year. And of those, about two-thirds are nonfiction, and of those two-thirds that are nonfiction, I would say half of them are business books. So I do tons of business books. And outside of that, it's um, health, wellness, family, parenting, Personal development, any, anything that makes you a better person is probably something I would publish. So Mary Lou Quinlan is an amazing rock star woman. I hope you all would have the chance to hear or meet her. She's a New Yorker. She uh, runs a, a firm called Just Ask a Woman, and they do market research for Fortune 500 companies on how women buy. So she came to me with a business book after she had previously published with New York Office, and that book was called uh, What She's Not Telling You. And it was the most, it's a little bit of a sidebar, but it's the most fascinating book if you're in sales and marketing, because in her work doing focus groups around why women buy, there are some very specific questions that you have to ask to get to the truth of why a woman is probably not buying. And the example she profiles in her book is around the Dove Real Women campaign. Y'all remember that, where they, they used women with real shapes in their ads, and they were all like, thank you, finally. Well, do you know what happened to Dove sales that quarter? <laughs> So we all love that haven, and we love the campaign, and nobody bought the product. <laughs> and she thought that was the most interesting, right? There was a complete separation. It didn't convert us into buyers, even though we applauded the campaign. So she does this very interesting work like that, and um, just a real go-getter in the business space. Unexpectedly lost her mother. She was the only child in a very Catholic family. And she wrote a beautiful piece for Real Simple Magazine that was just going to be a, a magazine piece about as she was cleaning out mom's home, she found first one basket and then another and another full of these little slips of paper that had, um, mother was very religious, had prayers on them. And it was her way of kind of living this let go, let God mentality. But as they kept finding basket after basket and box and box of these little slips of paper, it was like a time capsule of her mother's life and going all the way back to when she was a child. And her mother is praying for things like let Mary Lou have a successful pitch when she goes into this Fortune 500 company tomorrow. And then as mom gets older, it's her prayers for uh, her sick husband's white blood cell count to improve as he's battling cancer. And it's heart-wrenching. So the piece that she wrote in Real Simple, there was not a dry eye in our office. We all sent it around and we were just falling our faces off. And we called her and said, just congratulations, that was an awesome piece. And this was maybe September-ish, I can't remember the year, maybe five years ago. <laughs> And she came back and said, you know, a lot of people have been telling me that. And I know it's fast. Publishing moves really slowly. And, and I think I want to have a book to honor her. And I want it to come out on Mother's Day. And I was like, that's not going to happen. <laughs> that's just, it takes us usually a good year to get a book from start to finish. And she said, no, it's going to happen. So not only did this pistol make it happen, this is the book. And it became a New York Times bestseller, at which point she was happy. Uh, but I love her. And she created an entire multimedia world. I'll pass this around if you want to look at it. It's a beautiful book. And a great Mother's Day gift. You haven't got mom anything for this weekend. The, the um, culmination of it, of course, was a book. But she did a one woman <laughs> off Broadway play. She did a short film. She did an app. Um, she did a, a complete social media campaign. She had a team of probably five or six people. So she really made it into a movement, and that's an extreme example of somebody who really leveraged the influence part of her world that she happened to know very well. She has a background that lent itself to that. But it 
it just went. And once it got some momentum, as is hopefully the case for anybody who's working on something like this, it really snowballed and she found a new audience person after new audience person. They told a friend, and then here we are with this you know, blockbuster book that came together in no time flat. So she's somebody who used influence in a really smart way and approached it through, again, a, a really multimedia experience. She already explained to me that she didn't have to think, so it's really not about my speaking. <laughs> Oh, good. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, awesome. Great. That's great. Thanks. And then this is an example that I profile on my book. I can't believe I bought this. <laughs> this is Kendall and Kylie Jenner's book. I don't mean to offend anybody who's a follower. Um, but this is now in my Amazon purchase history, so. <laughs> <laughs> I will never work there, obviously. So, Kendall and Kylie Jenner, of course, have a combined Instagram following of 150 million, which is. It's more than the population of Mexico. It's more than the population of Japan. And it's just astounding how many people follow them. And publishers love that because they think, oh, that's going to convert into zillions of book sales, right? You just start to do some easy math, and it feels like a home run. Well, no, because that platform is not aligned with, in this case, um, badass female science fiction, which I suspect was intended to be a film vehicle for them down the road. Maybe it still is. <laughs> These numbers might not um, make sense to you without the context, but this book has sold, as it came out in 2014, has sold 16,000 copies, which I guarantee you the publisher is disappointed in. I think they were probably hoping for at least a million. These are the Jenner sisters. And when you do the math on that, I work for a publishing company, so I have to make a note. Uh, 0. 0.0008, which after a few bright lights in the office looked at it this morning, we, just, we agreed it's 8,000 seven percent. <laughs> I'll look at the finance guy here in front of me. So that's a terrible conversion rate for those of you who aren't marketing. And it really speaks to the fact that their audience is not aligned with this particular product launch. So that's the other thing, is you're not looking for anybody, just anybody in your audience. You're looking for the right audience, and you want them to buy into your message. You're not heavily recruiting just to build the numbers. Better to have a quality list than a quantity list. And then income, everybody's favorite subject. So, um, most cases, this book is a twenty dollars product, and you're not going to get rich on a twenty dollars product unless you're selling a whole lot of twenty dollars products. And you're not keeping the whole twenty bucks, by the way. Your mm -hmm. publisher is taking some kind of that. You have to produce the thing for self-publishing. So, let's say maybe it's half of that suddenly. So you have to sell even more. Um, there are a lot of jokes about poor authors, and that's part of the reason why. It's just the economics of how this works. It's, you have to be Stephen King writing blockbusters <coughs> to be able to keep your feet up, and then you sort of keep writing more books. So the reason we talk about this in terms of this ecosphere of ideas, influence, and income is because the book is one tool, and I talk about it as the mother load, holy grail of content marketing. And there's a lot of buzz around content marketing, and you need to blog, and you need to do video stuff on YouTube, and you need your social media presence. If you start with the book, and you have this foundational piece that covers your framework, it covers your philosophies, it covers whatever it is that you're trying to share with your audience, you can deduce and retract from the book and extract from the book to create other vehicles for that content. So you're repurposing your, the first bit of really hard work that you did. Once you have this holy grail of content, you can take pieces of it and develop workbooks, you can develop apps, you can do um, train the trainer programs, very popular mastermind groups. Somebody was talking about mastermind earlier, a lot of authors doing that, podcasts. All your content's already here, so it's really just a matter of being smart and using it in a strategic way so you can monetize all that hard work. I uh, folded the flap over to this particular page. This is Positive Intelligence, a book that we published probably 10 years ago, and it still sells incredibly well. New York Times bestseller. And this gentleman was a uh, muckety muck at salesforce.com, and he went off on his own as a speaker, consultant, and trainer. And you can see, I, I love that he did this. Some people think it's a little bold to try to sell your reader on these last few pages. I said, go for it. You already got them. If they've got this far, <laughs> you might as well try to convert them into a little bit more. So you'll see here some of the ideas and the ways that he's bringing them to his website to capture more value. They've already bought in. They, they're saying, I love your book. This is great. I finished it. How many of us finished the book? So he's got them book, line, and sinker. Now he needs to monetize that audience. So you'll see in that little tab there some of the things that he's done. And those are very typical ways to do that. So 
Um, what you can't do is sit back and say, there's a little bit of false logic after you write a book, it's so hard, and it takes so long that you almost expect great things will come because you did all of that work. Great things should come, right? You, you can't just sort of push it out there and hope for the best. It's not a, if we build it, they will come. I've seen people do it a million times. And I have maybe one or two examples of sleeper hits where the author really didn't do much, but the book just sort of exploded, and there's always some weird story around it. It just doesn't happen. Um, sometimes the Wall Street Journal profile, a self-published author who sold, you know, 20 zillion copies, and then my authors will say to me, well, so-and-so didn't even have a publisher, and they sold 20 zillion copies. <laughs> there's a reason they're being profiled, and it's an extreme exception. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. So, um, again, I hope that you all will pepper me with whatever questions you may have or any direction or guidance you may need. But the book is there for you as a tool to help you think about these three pillars, ideas, influence, and income. Um, and it doesn't matter if you're writing a book or if you read it and say, I don't think a book is right for me. Especially if you're in technology or you're in something dealing with um, politics or current events. The book is a time-bound vehicle, and it might not make sense for you to publish in that format. You might need something that's a little bit more flexible, so you can make updates as things like technology and current events change. So that's another thing to think about. Um, and then finally, uh, I'll give you all my contact info. It's, it's my email is Tanya at GreenleafBookGroup.com. It's kind of long. T-A-N-Y-A at GreenleafBookGroup.com. And on Twitter, I'm at Tanya Hall, and it's Tanya like Tanya. T-A-N-Y-A. <laughs> Could you write that stuff down on the board? You're not. Yes. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> You're not Tanya. Thanks for that. Oh, I'm on Instagram. Yes. Um, but that's that's silly and stuff. <laughs> that's not. I mean, it's, it's totally fine to divide up your social media. I'm serious as hell on Twitter, mm -hmm. and then I'm a total goofball on Instagram. Which I'm all in there. <laughs> I started following you. Oh, you did. Bless your heart. <laughs> I might have some explaining to do. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> I don't. I don't filter myself on Instagram. What's your name on Instagram? I don't think I follow it. It's Tanya. It's Lasagna. <laughs> and I do hate Lasagna. That's the email. And then this is Twitter. And then you must. <laughs> There's a, a rather extensive section on that in the book, first of all, so I would encourage you to read that. But in general, um, there are three primary ways to publish. There's self-publishing, which you can go to CreateSpace or a company called Lightning Source, literally upload your manuscript or click a button and then it's quote published. And people like me will look down our nose if you haven't had an editor and a proper designer and all of that. So I would be careful because that's your brand. And it's really hard to retract it once it's out there. But there are plenty of, of really good self-published books, and for some people that is the right path. That leaves you in control. That leaves you uh, also as the general contractor and doing all of the work of finding the editor and the designer and so on. But you hold on to your rights, which is important for a lot of people who use the book as a business tool. Um, traditional publishing is sort of the other end of the spectrum of what most people think about when they think about a publisher. So these are the New York houses. There's only five left. Uh, they've all consolidated, so it's Simon Schuster and Harper Collins and all those guys. The typical path there is to find a literary agent who represents your work, hopefully gets multiple bids from the different houses. You sell them the right to publish your book, and along with that, you let go of a little bit of control because 
and I love talking to business people because they get this. It's like venture capital versus bootstrap. When you take on venture capital, someone else has some skin in the game and they've got some say in the product. It's only fair. Mm -hmm. uh, you, they're also keeping the lion's share on the back end. Well, you'll get an advance on your royalties, a small one for a first time author, and then a smaller royalty if you earn out the advance. That gets complicated. Mm -hmm. um, that's a longer process because it can take six months to a year just to find and secure an agent. And then the agent may take another three months to help you develop a proposal, which is what you use to pitch. And it's going to be a bit about you. It's going to be a bit about your background, your plans to market the book, the book itself, some sample chapters. And then it's going to take a good year to get the publishing deal done, locked and loaded. We may add some time onto that to actually publish the book. So it's a, it's a really long process is what I'm trying to say. And for some people that matters, for others they don't really care. Uh, and then there's a middle road, which is where my company falls, and it's, we call it hybrid publishing, where we're taking some of the elements of self-publishing, where the author's contributing to the costs of printing and editing and so forth, mm -hmm. but they're keeping their rights and control of their work. Um, we, we're careful about who we pick, obviously, so that we can make sure that they'll take our advice. Oh, good. But <laughs> hybrid, 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 literally a blend of self-publishing and traditional publishing. But a, a, a lot of companies will call themselves a hybrid publisher. What you're looking for is somebody who actually has the distribution muscle to get the book into the airports, the retail accounts, has the best sellers, so you know you're not just doing assistant self-publishing. So that's um, that's a lot of work, frankly, to sort through those options and figure out what's important to you. And you'll need to think about things like, we talked about speed to market, how important it is for you to hold on to your rights, whether or not you're ready to invest money in the project, or you need someone else to fund it. And there's options to take you in, in either direction, but um, the book will take you through most of those questions. Does that help? Mm -hmm. Yes? I just want to say thank you for letting us keep our own rights. I mean, like, <laughs> I, that's what I won't do. You know, that's why I won't do a publisher. And it does, like, it is a little, like, I know it's super easy to put a book on Create Space in, like, an hour or five minutes, or I don't know what it is, but... Uh, that doesn't mean you should. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. like you said, it is your brand, and so when you said that they keep the rights and they keep most of the money, I was like, oh, I'm not doing that. Most people have, most but, business people have that same reaction, because they understand, as I'm sure you understand, the value of real life property. Especially if that's your work. If you're a consultant or a speaker, you are your ideas. And so there's a lot of risk in letting someone else have, um, even if you have a pretty generous contract with that publisher, you still have loopholes to jump through now. So if you want to develop a workbook, or um, in many cases, I've seen, I've seen this fall apart many times where the author says, I'm, I'm going to do a train the trainer program where other people are facilitators for my content, and they're going to go out, and this is how I'm going to scale my business. And then the publisher goes, no, you're not, because we have those rights. Well, what are you going to do with those rights? You guys don't develop training programs. No, but we hold those rights. And so they're stuck until they're, uh, they either buy their rights back or they have to wait for that term to expire. So it's, um, it's a really crappy position to be in, as I'm sure you can attest, and it's hard to get out of. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't understand it until they're about to breach it. And then the publisher slaps them on the wrist and says, you can't do that. And it affects the, obviously I got my soapbox about this, it affects your brand control as well. I had another author, Kara Rada, who built an awesome real estate company that was very much run by and for women and acknowledging that women are in residential real estate really the drivers behind the decision making when couples are buying homes, right? So the, the branding was very female and she had this, this very accessible, warm, open female tone and everything the company did and she wrote a book that she published with Riley, and it was called Real You, all about how she built and the philosophy behind empowering women in real estate. And the part of the book had a um, Gerber Daisy, like that was part of her brand. So she then came to us for her second book and wanted to have some consistency in her brand and use a different color of the same kind of Gerber Daisy on the cover. She couldn't do it. Because that cover belongs to the other publisher, and you can't iterate on something that doesn't belong to you in that way. Even if it's not identical, it's still like different in some way. They like, own the concept. So she was, she was stuck, and she had to take a total right turn with her brand, which obviously deletes it. 
And so, again, yeah, she didn't anticipate that. She wasn't really thinking about writing book two. She didn't think about this daisy becoming such an integral part of her brand, but it did. So here, here we are. So it's little things like that that um, kind of underscore. We didn't talk a lot about rights today. That's a whole different lecture. But um, that, those types of things, and again, I would say, you know, talk to a lawyer. But if you want to really safeguard your options on the front end, and your intellectual property is your livelihood. So the more you can carve out that stays with you, the better off you'll be. And uh, so how does the revenue work? How does the profit work with you guys? With us? So in our model, the author is funding the production costs. If, if you're familiar with how these entities work, it's like we're a distributor offering publishing services. So they are, it depends on the scope of what we're doing on the service side. They might be paying for editorial or design or marketing or printing or any combination of those. And then on the distribution side, we're keeping just 10% of uh, if we look at the cover price, we're keeping 10% of the cover price, they're getting 35 to 40 and the rest goes to the retail partners. So the other thing about that is the author, because they invest in the books, they own the books. And so people who have a, a nice speaking platform or they're consultants, if you're in a traditional deal where you have to buy your books back from a publisher, they don't give you a tremendous discount. <laughs> you might buy them back for 40% off the cover price, sometimes you can get them cheaper on Amazon. So, and I don't mean to get down in the weeds, but if you are anticipating doing a lot of those types of direct sales through speaking or on your website or just consulting work, or you just want to give books away to potential clients, it's important that you actually own them and it actually works out to your benefit in a situation like ours where you're, you're paying for the printing costs of the book, but you don't have to buy them back from us because you're paying for them, if that makes sense. Awesome. Yeah. So it, our, our model is good for somebody who has that strong direct sales platform because that's what helps them to offset the upfront investment. Awesome. I have a quick question for you just regarding um, publishing and editing because I'm actually uh, working on editing a book right now. It's not my book, it's someone else's. Um, and um, she wants to self-publish and she's in a hurry and just if you could have some quick advice for an editor working with an author who is a big idea person but like didn't have an outline to start and is pretty disorganized but wants to rush to get it out. Um, I've been trying to kind of coach her as far as like maybe we should create some structure and you know the outline piece has been big but she's real big on the ideas and just I have more information, I have more material. Um, what would you maybe just like top three words of advice for like a new editor? It's the role that I'm in right now. You're in a pickle. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I, I work with those authors, and, and they're really, these are the big idea, high energy people, and they, they don't, it takes discipline and a slower mindset to stop and do this heavy lifting of, of first developing an entire outline and then bring your energy. Right. But I would say um, remind your author that you are a proxy for the reader. You are not there to bully her or. Critique her. A lot of people have this sort of built-in resistance to editors, yeah. <laughs> left over from high school probably, or mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But um, that would be my, my, I think, above all, is just a reminder that your job is to represent the reader, and that's what you're trying to do on her behalf. And then, is it a business book? No, it's actually a book of advice. Um, it was supposed to be for her son originally, but then she was like, ooh, this, I might publish it later and have it be a wider release for a broader audience, but he's graduating from high school, so it's like words of wisdom as you go on your way. Is that the rush? Um, yes. Okay. Yeah. The other thing that I, I could talk for days about is shotgun publishing. And <laughs> just don't, don't rush it, because you're going to pay for it later in terms of, I don't know what her big picture goals are, but the, the quality of the book and to risk your brand is generally not worth it. And if, I have so many people who come knocking on our door saying, so I did this book and I kind of rushed it and I'm not real proud of it. Do you think you guys could help me fix it and we could redo it and relaunch it? And that's it. Why don't you just do it right the first time? So yeah. it's because they didn't have the discipline to slow down and get it right. Well, if you, you self-publish the create space, but you don't release it on Amazon, is that going to affect your brand? It depends on how. There's ways to do that where you can basically you're using them as a printer at that point. Okay. If you if you can keep it to where it's just being printed and it's never released, and you should be able to do that, uh -huh. then it's okay. Okay. And then you can do you know the, the correct version for broader consumption. Right. Okay. <laughs> Well, down the road. <laughs> but that's hard. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so we should probably wrap okay. up. Um, I have the books here. We should have an 
now if we might want to chart one out. Okay, uh, I'm going to send you whoever's here. That's just perfect. So we can pass out. And if you guys want to, like, if um, you want Tanya to sign them, mm -hmm. she can sign it for you.